when I used to teach kids when I was in children's ministries, and no, I'm not going to do another song and dance this morning. But I used to ask them this question, what comes to mind when, when you think of love? What do you think about when, when I mention the word love? And I ask you the same thing, what comes to mind when you hear the word love? Now with kids, I would get answers like this. You know, they would talk about the, you know, the person they like, the person that likes them, you know, the crushes that they have. They would talk about the, you know, the Valentine notes that they'd pass to, to one another. Remember those Valentine cards that we'd have to take in and pass to everybody in the class? And um, uh, they, would, they would mention, you know, like those, those candy hearts with the cheesy sayings on them, you know, mine forever. You know, uh, Lucky Charms. You know, the pink, squishy hearts. I love Lucky Charms, actually. I could eat just like a bowl full of just the marshmallows. <laughs> Nowadays, you know, they might answer, you know, heart emojis. Or, you know, what is it, you know, that people... How do they do that with their hands? Oh, I love you. So cute, right? But the love that we see in the scriptures, the love of God, the love that's demonstrated by God, the love that the followers of Jesus are called to demonstrate, that love is so different. It's way different. In fact, I don't even think we can truly wrap our minds around the love of God, how powerful it is. Powerful, life-transforming, world-changing love. That's not an exaggeration. Life-transforming, world-changing love. And so I would tell the kids, you know, let's get a better picture in our minds of, of, of love and how strong God's love is strong. And I'd have them, you know, say it with me with power. God's love is strong. And, you know, and I'd have them do like a motion like that would use their whole bodies like boom, 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 like that. Like, and, like get into it. You know, God's love is strong and flex. Can you do that? Come on, do it with me. God's love is strong. Does that look like a heart? Looks, I don't know. I just want to flex my muscles. Why do we talk about love so much? Maybe you say, hey, you know, you talk about love way too much. Well, in Paul's letter of Ephesians, depending on the translation you use, he mentions the word love 17 times approximately 17 times in this one letter in just six short chapters. 17 times he talks about love. And, of course, you know, you remember the, the expert in the law came to Jesus the one, the one day and said, hey, Jesus, you know, boil this down for us. What's the most important thing we should be doing? What's the, the, what's the greatest commandment? And Jesus says, Love God and love your neighbor. No, Jesus, we just wanted one command. Just, just one command was all we were after. Jesus said it is one command. Two sides of the same coin. You, you can't separate the two. In fact, the way you show your love for God is by loving the people around you. You can't separate the two. It's powerful love. It's, it's life-changing love world-changing love. And I, I, think, I think even nowadays we struggle with that same thing. I think we would ask Jesus the same question. What's this all about? Why do we do this Christian life thing? Just boil it down for us, Jesus. And the answer would be the same. It's love. It's love. Powerful, life-transforming, world-changing love. Paul also said in Romans, you know, love is the fulfillment of the entire law. Love is the fulfillment of the entire law. So as Christians, we've got one command. Just one. Just one command. To love. 
to love. And so if we don't get this right, we're in trouble. And I think that's why we have been in trouble in our country today, in our churches today. Because I don't, I don't necessarily think that we have truly embraced, fully embraced this one command of love. And so we're going to talk about it today because Paul talked about it in Ephesians. So Ephesians chapter 4, and we're going to start with verse 25, and we're going to go through chapter 5, verse 2. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 25. Follow along in your Bibles. Open up your Bible apps or listen as I read. Ephesians 4, starting with verse 25. Therefore, putting away lying, speaking the truth, each one to his neighbor, because we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. Don't let the sun go down on your anger. Don't give the devil an opportunity. Let the thief no longer steal. Instead, he is to do honest work with his own hands so that he has something to share with anyone in need. No foul language should, should come from your mouth, but only what is good for building up someone in need so that it gives grace to those who hear. And don't grieve God's Holy Spirit. You were sealed by him for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, anger, and wrath, shouting, and slander be removed from you along with all malice. And be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving one another, just as God also forgave you in Christ. Therefore, be imitators of God as dearly loved children and walk in love as Christ also loved us and gave himself for us. A fragrant, sacrificial, a sacrificial and fragrant offering to God. So once again, we have some commands here, right? You know, some ways that we should live, ways that we should walk. We've been talking about walking the past couple of weeks. Ways that we should walk. And these are not there just for no reason, right? I mean, these aren't just rules for rules' sake. It's not like God likes rules. So he just has a bunch of ways to live just for, for the fun or just, you know, because he receives some kind of, uh, you know, joy out of us following some, you know, rules just for rules' sake. It's not like he's trying to keep us from doing whatever we want to do and having fun. That's not why he has these rules. Why does he have these things? Why are we supposed to walk this way and live this way? To help us love better. That's the reason to help us love better and specifically to help us love people better, our horizontal relationships. So don't lie. Why shouldn't we lie? Because lying hurts people. It also hurts yourself, but it hurts people. Lying breaks trust in relationships. Telling a lie leads to a lack of trust. It leads to unhealthy, superficial relationships. So don't lie. Get a, get a handle on your anger. Get, get a control over, over your anger. Well, why? Well, we, okay, we know that anger in and of itself isn't, isn't a sin, right? You know, there is such a thing as righteous anger. But it's so easy for us to, to focus our righteous anger towards people. And we say things like this, hate the sin, but love the sinner. It's so easy to say. That's so easy to say, but really hard to do. It's really hard to do because as sinful, imperfect people, it's really hard to distinguish our motives. So hard to distinguish our motives, and motives matter. We just talked about that a couple weeks ago. Motives matter. So when our anger is directed towards someone else, it's wrong. It's wrong. So we have to get a handle on it, or it's going to creep in and destroy our relationships. Don't steal. Why shouldn't we steal? Well, as followers of Jesus, we work hard so that we have extra so that we can share with those in need. We can be generous towards others. Instead of, I deserve this, I've earned this, I want this, I'm gonna take this for myself, our attitude is God owns it all. And he's blessed. He's blessed me with so much. He's blessed me with what I have so that I can use it for his kingdom purposes. Instead of taking, we're open-handed with people. No foul language, the word for foul, or maybe in your translation it says corrupt, is actually the, the same word that's used for spoiled fish or rotten fruit. Not a 
pretty picture, right? So every time we open our mouths, we have an incredible opportunity to build people up or tear them down, to, to kill or to, to destroy or to bring life. We have the opportunity to build people up or either, or either stink up the place, right? power in our words and then and then you know as we read he says don't grieve the holy spirit what's he talking about there we talked about that back in chapter one several weeks ago that when we put our trust in christ we are marked with a seal we're marked with a seal it's the seal of the holy spirit in our lives that's our stamp and stamps and seals were used back in that day to uh to to mark some something authenticity Ownership, And so the Spirit's work in our lives is our mark of authenticity, our seal that we belong to Him. We're, we're stamped, we're stamped by the Holy Spirit with His fruit. It shows how we're authentic, love and joy and peace and all the, all the fruit of the Spirit. And so when, when we're not living in this way and we're treating people poorly, it grieves, it grieves the Holy Spirit. And, and he continues, let all bitterness and anger and wrath and shouting and slander be removed from you along with all malice. And these are all about the horizontal relationship. And be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving one another, just as God also forgave you in Christ. And then we get to the end of the chapter. And as probably most of you know, the original manuscripts of, of Scripture don't have chapters and verses. So when Paul was writing this letter, he was just writing a letter. He didn't include chapters and verses. Those, those were added sometime in the 1500s. And in a lot of cases, it's helpful for us as we're reading, but in some, some cases, it's not. And so some biblical scholars, most biblical scholars, believe that Paul is continuing his thought here, that it shouldn't be the end of a chapter, that actually chapter 5, verses 1 and 2, conclude what Paul is saying Therefore, be imitators of God as dearly loved children and walk in love as Christ also loved us and gave himself for us, a sacrificial and fragrant offering to God. So this sums up Paul's section. This is, this is why we walk towards others in this way. Because God loves people. I know it's hard to believe. God loves people. God loves you. Isn't that hard to believe? God loves me. That's even more hard to believe. He loves people. And because he loves people, he wants us to love people in the same way. He wants us to imitate him so that they can experience his powerful, life-transforming, world-changing love through us, through his children. And so, you know, we know that children often you know, copy their parents' behavior, right? For the good and for the bad. And uh, what they see modeled for us, they, they sometimes follow in our footsteps. So what do we see modeled for us? What kind of love do we see from our Father? What kind of love do we see from His Son, Jesus? And how can we as dearly loved children imitate that love follow in their footsteps let's talk about what this kind of love actually looks like first of all it's active love it's active love therefore be imitators of God as dearly loved children and walk in love, live in love, as Christ also loved us and gave himself for us. It's an act of love. How do we know that God loves us? How do we know? God so loved the world that he gave. Paul also says that God demonstrates his love for us. That while we were sinners, he Christ died for us. He loved the world. He gave. He demonstrates. You know, love isn't just a, an emotion that God feels. 
towards his, his people. Like, you know, he has strong feelings towards his, towards his people, towards us, towards the people that he created. But it's not just a, a feeling. It's his action on our behalf. He demonstrates his love for us. We know God loves us because of Jesus. Jesus isn't just a proclamation of his love. Jesus is a demonstration of his love. The word made flesh, something for us to experience. We've experienced his love as dearly loved children because God gave and Jesus gave of himself. It's a love that's seen, not just a love that's heard. It's a love that's experienced because, because it's active love. It's also sacrificial love. Let's, let's read it again. Therefore, be imitators of God as dearly loved children and walk in love as Christ also loved us and gave himself for, uh, for us a sacrificial and fragrant offering to God. The word used here for love, and you probably know this, you've probably heard this a lot, is, is the Greek word agape. Agape love, and it's, it's the most common word used for love in the New Testament this kind of love, God's kind of love. And as we've talked about before, the New Testament writers had a really hard time describing this kind of love because it was so different. It was so unusual. They hadn't seen this type of love before. And so they actually started using God himself and the love that God shows to, to describe this love. Here's an example in 1 John. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Agape comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. God is agape. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This kind of love comes from God. This kind of love is, is who God is. And, and agape is so different and it's so unusual because it's sacrificial love. Sacrificial, putting self aside for the benefit of another. It's the kind of love that gives its life away so that someone else can experience life. And this kind of love, this sacrificial love, will always cost you something. It always costs this kind of sacrificial love cost the father his son. This kind of sacrificial love cost Jesus greatly. I mean, he gave up his rightful place in heaven next to the father to, to, to come to earth and become a human being, to draw near to human beings relationally. And Paul says it this way in Philippians, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. What was, his, what was Jesus' mindset? Who being in the very nature God, did not consider equality, equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, God in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death even death on a cross it cost Jesus his reputation as he hung out with disreputable people it cost him as he stood before Pilate beaten to a pulp and bloodied I mean how difficult must it have been for him to not retaliate to not prove himself as the son of God. It cost him his right to defend himself. He, he, his self-sacrificial actions spoke volumes more. And of course it cost him his very life as, as he laid down his life for not only his disciples, and let me remind you that they had just deserted him, betrayed him, he laid down his life for his accusers and the ones who were beating him and spitting on him and mocking him, his enemies, which includes you and me, because it's sacrificial love. And, and then finally, it's, it's fragrant love. 
Therefore, be imitators of God as dearly loved children and walk in love as Christ also loved us and gave himself for us a sacrificial and fragrant offering to God. Paul is, is talking about the sacrificial system, the Old Testament sacrificial system. That, that should take us back as you know, animals were sacrificed and burned on the, offer, on the altar. It's such a, a, a horrible picture. Such a, such a horrible, uh, bloody picture of, of what sin costs. A concrete example for the people. Sin always causes death. Sin causes death. And because God is just, can't allow evil to run rampant in his world, a sacrifice was made and the smoke from the offering from that sacrificed animal would, would rise to the heavens and the Old Testament describes it as a sweet-smelling aroma to God. And so <laughs> when Jesus died on the cross, it was God's great love for humanity and his justice to confront sin and evil in his world that collided head-on in the death of his son. And so for Jesus himself, listen, there was no gain or benefit for him showing this kind of love, right? I mean, obviously three days later, he triumphed and he rose from the dead, and that's awesome. But, but in that moment, what did he experience? Pain, tremendous pain, heartbreak, and loss. You see, in demonstrating this kind of active sacrificial love he had to endure and he lost his life in a, in a horrific way. Why did he do that? Well, because he loved us greatly, but also because he was being obedient to the Father's will. Not my will, but yours be done. So he loved in this way because it was God's will, a humble, fragrant love offering that was pleasing to the Father. This kind of love is a sweet-smelling aroma to God. When he sees his children loving in this way, he's very pleased. So, therefore, be imitators of God as dearly loved children and walk in love as Christ also loved us and gave himself for us, a sacrificial and fragrant offering to God. So it really, it, it does all come down to this. Are, are you able to imitate God in this way? Follow in the footsteps of Jesus. Walk in love, in this kind of love. And so, in order to help us evaluate, I just, I have some questions that I think we should really wrestle with. The first question is this. What will love require of me? Let's really think about this here. What will love require of me? This kind of love requires action. Sometimes in the church, amongst believers, church leaders, we hear things like this. Just preach the gospel. Just preach the gospel. Well, let's think about this. If the gospel is God loved, so God gave, then the gospel is more than just words. The gospel is demonstration as well as proclamation. It's the Word made flesh, right? The Word made flesh. So how will people know in our world, in our workplaces, in our schools, in our communities, outside these walls, how will they know that God loves them? How will they know? That's what the church is for. That's what you and I are here for. When, as dearly loved children, we imitate His love by drawing near to them outside these walls, Outside these walls, in the flesh, love incarnate. Actively loving the people whom God loves. We can sit in these chairs Sunday after Sunday. I can sit up here in this chair and we can talk about God's love and we can bask in the, in the love of God for us and we can sit in our Bible studies week after week and we can debate theology and doctrine, filling our brains with all kinds of knowledge. And that's, that's important. But maturity is not measured in how much we know. It's measured in how much we love. 
Are we becoming more and more and more like Jesus? That's maturity. I hear people say all the time, I want to go to a church that has deep teaching, that digs into the scriptures in a deep way, or I want to attend that Bible study because we're going to dig deep into the scriptures, and usually what they're saying is, we just want it to be complicated. <laughs> we want to hear how complicated it is. We want to, you know, we, uh, we just, we want to, um, you know, get to the original language and the historical context and hear all these interesting and important facts about the scriptures, and those things are important. The original language, the meaning, all that stuff is very important. There's a place for all that. But it's not deep teaching. It's not deep teaching until there's an inward heart transformation that leads to love. It's that simple. It's that simple. It's not complicated at all. And, you know, so we can say God, God loves you. We can say it. God loves you. God loves you. And we love you. We love you. And, you know, here, here's our little heart. But they won't believe it. They won't believe it until they see it. They won't even believe that we believe it <laughs> until they see that it's made a difference in our lives. See it when we demonstrate it. See that it's really made an impact in our lives. And, and so that's why that's a goal for every community group here at Living Grace. That's the goal. We've got to get outside into our community Proclaim God's love, demonstrate God's love on a regular basis. If there's no action, there's no love. So what will love require of me today? What will love require of me this week? What will love require me in my everyday walking? What will love cost me? We talk about the, the parable of the Good Samaritan all the time. This, we actually had a series a couple years ago on, the, on this parable. Just an incredible par parable. Such a radical story that Jesus told. So radical. I mean, Jesus made the enemy of the story to be the hero in the story. And then you've got these two good guys, you know, the, the, the good Jewish people who were doing the right thing. They thought they were doing what was right. They were going to, to worship. They didn't want to, be, you know, become ceremonially unclean or whatever. And then you, you have this Samaritan who comes along who didn't even worship God correctly. He didn't worship God in the right way. His theology was terrible, but he was the one who actually loved God. He was the, actually the one who was obedient because he did the right thing. So radical. <laughs> I mean, incredible. The point of the story, who is my neighbor? Who should I love? Everyone. Everyone, even my enemy. If I'm not loving those who are difficult to love, then I'm not being obedient. I'm definitely not imitating the Father's love. And so, you know, I don't know about you. Over the past couple of years, it's just gotten crazy in our country, right? I mean, it's get, it gets more and more and more, you know, crazy and divisive and um, it's just, it's nuts. Lines have been drawn. So many lines drawn. The way people have been treating others on the other side has just been horrific. On, you know, the, the other side of an issue, the other, the other political party, on the other side of computer screens and social media, you know, just treating people with hatred and contempt if they're on the other side. And, and here's the sad thing, that, and we've witnessed it, a lot of Christians have followed suit, responding and living and acting in the same way. As Jesus followers, there's no question in how we should act if we're truly God's children, imitating the Father's love. The way we act should be in stark contrast to all of that. Stark contrast to all that. In the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew chapter 5, verse 43, it says, You have heard that it was said, Love your neighbor and hate your enemy. That was, that was the right thing to do back in that day. That was just the normal thing. You know, love your neighbor, but hate your enemy. Of course you do that. That's what comes naturally. But I tell you, Jesus said, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you that you may be children of your Father in heaven. Now that, that would have blown them away. 
He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? The worst of the worst can do that. And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even the pagans do that? God's love is most shocking it's most perplexing. It's most reckless. And we're going to sing a song about that in a little bit. Shocking, perplexing, reckless. And it will make people sit up and take notice when it's demonstrated to those on the other side, to our enemies. This kind of love powerfully stands out when it's shown towards someone or a group of someone whom we disagree with. So, if you're really going to love in this way, it will cost you. It will cost you. It'll cost you to remain quiet when you want to speak out and prove that you're right, just like Jesus before Pilate. It'll cost you to draw near relationally to someone, to love someone, to serve someone, to give of yourself to someone whom you disagree with. Maybe you disagree vehemently with them, their lifestyle, their viewpoints, their belief. It will cost you to give of yourself to them anyway. It'll cost you to pri pri prioritize people over your political party or ideology or viewpoint. People always come first, always. If your view leads you to treat people poorly or speak poorly, you've got the wrong view. You've got the wrong view. And Jesus was very clear on this, very clear. So if we're imitating the love demonstrated for us, when we were yet sinners, then we take it a step further and we lay down our lives. We set some things aside. We even serve our enemies in love. So what will this kind of love cost me as I sacrifice for the sake of others? And then, and then the final question is, am I willing to love because it pleases God? A message that I've been hearing lately and maybe you've heard this message too, we hear this from church leaders, is, is that, you know, this kind of love is not going to work today in the world that we live in. You hear that message? It's just not going to work in the, in the world that we live in. We're losing ground in our culture. You hear that all the time. We're losing ground. We're losing power. This kind of love doesn't work in our current situation that we're living. We need to get tough. It's time to get tough. It's time to fight. We don't, we, it's not time to lay down our lives. It's time to fight. We hear that a lot. Don't, I don't know if you hear that, but I hear it all the time. Even if people wouldn't actually say that, their actions, their actions show that that's the case. Let's think about the early church for a second. What do we learn from the early church? I mean, the world they lived in was so much more corrupt than the world that we live in today. They had no power, absolutely no power, no influence in their society. They were losing their lives in order to proclaim and demonstrate the good news. And if you were to tell them that eventually Christianity would become the religion of the empire— the accepted religion of the empire, it, wouldn't it, would, it would take 300 years for that to happen. If you were to tell them that, you know, Christianity would lead to great, great power and influence over the entire world, they probably would not have believed it. They loved because God commanded them to love. They laid down their lives because their king laid down his life. That's why they loved not for any kind of power or control or benefit, just because God told them to love. Listen, I talk about this all the time, and I firmly believe that, that if, if more Jesus followers would just imitate this kind of love, imitate their father, that, that I really think that our culture, our culture, our country, our world, the society we live in would, would, would completely be turned upside down. I firmly believe that powerful love, life-transforming, world-changing love. I really do believe that, but even if we don't see it, even if we don't see that in our lifetime, and even if our kids don't get to experience it, 
even if there's no benefit or gain whatsoever for living this way, even if it doesn't seem to work, we still love. We love because God commanded us to love. We love because God loves people. We love because he loves it when his children imitate his love. We love because this kind of love pleases the Father. It's a sweet-smelling aroma to our Heavenly Father. And that's why we do it. Will you read this with me? Therefore, be imitators of God as dearly loved children and walk in love as Christ also loved us and gave himself for us, a sacrificial and fragrant offering to God. Let's pray. God, we're so grateful for this time that we've had this morning. And, uh, you know, let it not just be a something that we just do every week and then we leave and just go back to our lives just doing the same old thing that we always do. I pray that your spirit will lead us and guide us. Help us to become more like your son Jesus and help us to truly love in this way. It's difficult. There's some questions we have to struggle with and wrestle with. But let us do that. Let us struggle. Let us wrestle. Let us just wade into the mess because this kind of love is so messy. But let's let's do it. Give us the strength to do it. Not so that we can, you know, grow our church. Not so that, you know, we can look good and people can say, wow. What good people. No, let's We want to do it so that people can say, wow, what a God. They can be drawn to you. And so I pray that you'll lead us and guide us through your spirit in that way. In Jesus' name, amen.